Good afternoon, uh, I guess good morning to my West Coast colleagues. Welcome to everyone. Data mining, machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing, AI. Gosh, the applications are nearly limitless and will continue to grow as the data accessible to scholars and researchers continue to grow. That's why I'm really pleased not only to introduce this session, but I am looking forward to watching it um, avidly because text and data mining offer enormous potential to support the scholarship our co faculty colleagues and our students are doing. Um, indeed, one of the most provocative, and I use the word provocative in the best possible sense of the word, um, paper I've read probably in the last decade was published in the Proceedings of the National Academies using ProQuest data um, to explore the question of the diversity innovation paradox. So I'd like to thank ProQuest, part of Clarivit, for their programmatic and financial support of this webinar, but also their participation as part of the um, sustaining visionary members of CGS's sustaining membership network. This is a, a huge demonstration of a commitment to improving graduate education, but we want to especially thank um, ProQuest for their contributions and support of the ProQuest CGS Distinguished Dissertation Awards. To my faculty colleagues, remember that the award deadline and nominations is available right now on the CGS website, and I think the deadline is June 30th. Of course, we also love the 3MT con, uh, showcase sponsored by ProQuest. It's probably the highlight of my year. That and the awards, I would say, are my highlights of the year. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the annual meeting. Um, and if you missed the competition, the 3MT competition at 2022, I believe those recordings, in fact, are available and you should watch them. It will bring you great joy and help explain why you do the things you do. In any event, at this point, I am most pleased to introduce Andrea Solomon, Vice Dean and Dean of Academic Affairs with the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia University. I will note that Columbia was one of our founding um, members when CGS was formed 60 plus years ago. For 25 years, so Andrea has not been around since his founding, but for the past 25 years, she's worked in academic affairs at Columbia. She began at the School of General Studies, which is the undergraduate college for non-traditional stu students, then worked in the Central Arts and Sciences, coordinating curriculum and policy across undergraduate schools, and for the last 11 years has been in her current role as Academic Affairs and Vice Dean of Columbia's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, home of 79 master's and doctoral programs. So without further ado, Andrea, I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Thank you so much. Please. You, you, you couldn't hear me at all. We could not. Sorry, we were trying to get your attention. <laughs> if you could start your remarks again, please. I can, absolutely. I was just saying nice things about all the people that are on this webinar, but I can certainly say them again. Uh, anyway, thank you, Suzanne, for introducing me. That was a very uh, lovely introduction. And of course, graduate education means everything to me. So this is a particular pleasure. Um, anyway, the, the methods of data mining and text mining allow our graduate students to conduct analyses at scale, going beyond the evaluation of single data sets to fully contextualize and extract unstructured data from millions of documents and sites. These methods at the nexus of machine learning, statistics, and data sets are being used across disciplines and are especially productive with interdisciplinary research. We hope with this webinar to showcase the precipitate of these research methods. Masters and doctoral students are among those at the forefront of such compelling new work. I look forward to hearing from two scholars dedicated to integrating these tools to produce important research. Holly Jackson, a master's candidate in human rights from Columbia University with a background in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. And Levi Boxnell, an economist and machine learning engineer who recently completed his PhD in economics. Congratulations, Levi. At this time, I would like to pass the virtual microphone to John Dillon with ProQuest who will serve as the webinar MC. John? Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, introducing our uh, two speakers today, Holly and Levi. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have them uh, on this webinar. And uh, 
We only have a short period of time, so I'm going to uh, turn things over to Holly first, and then Levi will uh, uh, will speak afterwards. And then I have a brief demo of TDM Studio, which was um, uh, requested, and then we'll open things up for Q&A. Uh, you can also drop Q&A uh, in the Q&A feature as you have them, and we'll try and tackle those as well. So uh, first up, Holly, over to you. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, John. Uh, if Sarah, if you could go to the, the first slide. Thanks so much. So today, I kind of want to talk about how I've been using TDM Studio to uh, understand media bias and incorporating a lot of the natural language processing techniques uh, that we've been talking about, how we're doing so with a very careful balance of quantitative and qualitative analysis. So I want to give a brief description of my background. I got a bachelor's in electrical engineering from MIT. And I'm currently pursuing a master's in human rights studies from Columbia University. So today I'm going to be carefully considering what we can learn from qualitative analysis to inform very powerful large scale quantitative analysis studies using some of the combined techniques from my background. So Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. So I first want to give a brief overview of some of the disadvantages and advantages of both qualitative and quantitative analysis. So we can learn what types of techniques we can import from qualitative analysis into our quantitative studies. So Sarah, if you go next. So there's a large scale of small scale qualitative work that ranges from very casual studies to more formal studies. At the most casual level, the public holds news organizations accountable on social media with maybe some small posts that describes ways in which media could be biased. On the other hand, the more formal level, academics and nonprofits produce studies of bias so they may define specific metrics, such as using word choice or linguistic features, or on a larger scale, they can talk about decontextualization and selective reporting on certain topics in the news. And with both of these levels of study, they are collected over time to create patterns of bias, which then activists can use to challenge media institutions to do better. So in general, these qualitative studies achieve a level of, of depth and they're able to go very deeply into certain maybe particular events or particular types of media bias. However, they often lack the ability to do breath as it's impossible for people to read decades and decades worth of news coverage. So Sarah, you can go to the next slide. So this is something that a large scale quantitative analysis actually allows us to begin to accomplish. However, this is not without limitations. We'll often hear about quantitative work sacrificing depths at the expense of potentially achieving breadth. So one type of quantitative analysis that we often see is tracking article metadata, which gives us a wonderful broad perspective, but often only accesses very small metrics. So in this graph here, I've shown a, a graph of headlines over a scale of 50 years about Israel and Palestine. Uh, in five different American newspapers. Now, this is a very useful metric, which allows us to see the frequency of reporting in the news. However, it only tells us just what it says, which is the presence of these names in the headlines and nothing else. We aren't able to talk about the quality of every specific article and what bias we might be seeing in each one of those. So Sarah, if you go to the next slide. So there opens up this potential for more sophisticated metrics through artificial intelligence, but this is territory where we wanna be at treading very carefully. In With these artificial intelligence methods, the computer is inferring what bias might be in the media itself. So applying them aimlessly can lead to some very unsavory results. And I've included a number of recent technical articles just in the past 10 years that have been talking about how the uncareful application of these AI-powered large language models can lead to Islamophobia, sexism, and racism, among other things. So if we want to apply an artificial intelligence technique, we need to do so considering both the technical benefits and detriments, as well as the benefits and detriments from a social science angle. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this means that we need to have a large scale quantitative study that can accurately identify media bias and uses careful metrics that have more than just metadata. And the way that I wanna talk about doing this today is actually using some of our, um, our lessons that we've learned from this small scale qualitative work. Instead of just picking up on a flashy computational technique, we can carefully learn from past qualitative work and what we can borrow in the quantitative context to further expand its impact. And as someone who has a background in CS but is currently studying human rights, this is an intersection I'm very excited to work in. 
So in the next few slides, I want to talk about three techniques that can be borrowed from qualitative analysis and applied in a large scale quantitative context. So if you could go next, Sarah. So the first strategy I want to talk about is voice. This is a strategy that's very often used in qualitative contexts in very in-depth studies. So I've included an example of reporting in the New York Times on social media after the murder of George Floyd and the uh, Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020. So I've highlighted a few examples. And if Sarah, if you can go next um, to show those examples, there's a really key aspect that's been picked up uh, by past studies of qualitative analysis of bias that is uh, shown in this example. So we see a few examples that are highlighted in yellow of the passive voice being used in this context. We see a man who died after being handcuffed, a photographer who was shot, and a reporter who was hit. Meanwhile, in red, we see an example in the active voice, protesters struck. There's a really key difference here. You'll notice in the example, a photographer was shot in the eye. We have no idea who shot the photographer. This is an artifact of the passive voice. The passive voice either eliminates the perpetrator or it delays your knowledge finding out the perpetrator. Like in the example on the left of George, George Floyd's murder, a man who died after being handcuffed. And then five words later, we finally see by an officer's knee. Whereas with the active voice, the actor, the perpetrator is put first. And this introduces very important questions of who is accountable and who is blamed. So identifying the active and passive voice, especially in the context of bias or of violence, can be a really key indicator of bias in our examples. So Sarah, could you go to the next slide? One second strategy that has been used in other more successful studies of quantitative work is identifying the accuracy and frequency of casualty reports in headlines and throughout the articles. So this is important because it not just allows us to compare this to real data of how many casualties actually occurred in a certain conflict or a certain event, but it also allows us to potentially analyze even deeper. We can look at how many casualties were reported in just one line, if more individual attention is given to each fatality, or if lots of fatalities are grouped in tens or hundreds. And this can give us the nature of how much care the media organization is putting into the reporting. Uh, next slide. The last strategy we can borrow from qualitative work is analyzing the sources that are quoted. So in considering a certain article, whether it's on foreign policy or a domestic topic, we can look at which person is speaking on this issue and what is their stake in the issue. Are they a human rights organization? Are they a military official who may, may be taking a defense and national security stance? Are they an American politician or are they a foreign politician? And how does that affect how their opinion is affecting our perception of fact? Next slide. So just to summarize these three strategies that we borrowed from qualitative work, we can look at active versus passive voice, the accuracy and frequency of casualty reports, and who is quoted in international topics. Next slide. Now we want to actually put this in the scope of a large scale quantitative study, which is going to require more than just knowing what metrics to use. First, we need access to very specific resources, and this is a lot harder than it looks. For a long time before I had access to the wonderful ProQuest TDM Studio, I was pining through different library resources, asking for hard drives full of data, and it's almost impossible to find. Only the New York Times offers an API for developers, and it only offers access to headlines. So finding access to these other resources, especially up to the present day, is near impossible. And this type of research that wants to achieve depth, not just breadth, needs access to headlines, article metadata, and full article text. And this is impossible without ProQuest TDM Studio. Next slide, Sarah. Another thing that needs to happen for these studies to take place is for us to be allowed to use sophisticated methodologies. And this includes state-of-the-art natural language processing toolkits to be able to identify syntax and grammar, like active and passive voice, to be able to uh, identify quotes. We need access to NLP toolkits that are only available in a sophisticated developer environment. Next slide, Sarah. I wanted to go into a bit about exactly how hard these methodologies are and why we need to be able to use these sophisticated techniques, but how they are doable with the state of the art. So the first example I want to show you is part of speech and voice detection, which allows us to do that metric of passive versus active voice I was talking about in the George Floyd example. So in this example, we can see that uh, the subject, action, and object can be easily identified by natural language processing toolkits based off their very sophisticated grammar and part of speech analysis. And from those taggings, we can actually infer the whether the passive or active voice is used. 
In this example, you can see Sally drove her car off the road or the car was driven off the road by Sally. In the passive voice case, the object comes before the subject and we're able to see um, that the passive voice puts the subject lower in the sentence. And if that prepositional phrase by Sally was removed, the subject wouldn't appear in the sentence. In the context of violent words such as injury or death, this becomes a lot more of an important metric and can actually show bias. Next slide. In addition, natural language processing allows for quote detection. So we're able to identify who is talking in the news. By identifying keywords such as said, noted, or war warned, the natural language processing algorithm can also identify the subject and then the content by extracting it from between the quotes. And we can keep track of all those subjects and figure out what are their associations to create a sort of demographic chart of the media. Next slide, Sarah. So I've actually uh, worked on two studies using ProQuest TDM Studio and related methods and data sets. And I, one of them I wanted to give a bit of a hint towards and the other one I'll give you a bit of a more full description. Um, the, my upcoming publication, I can't unfortunately tell you too much about, but it's about comparing basically coverage of Syria and Yemen versus the current conflict in Ukraine. So I've shown a small graph of the metadata that shows a strong rise in articles about Ukraine, but this study actually involves a lot of the more sophisticated metrics I've talked about in this presentation on the scale of 20 years. Next slide. A past study that I published um, applied the metric that I was talking about with active versus passive voice to articles about Palestine and Israel in the New York Times. And using these methods, I was actually able to prove a history of anti-Palestinian bias in the New York Times in the first and second intifadas, which is really important as this is a very controversial topic that often gets lost uh, in biased media narratives. And so it's important to be able to use specific metrics from qualitative data to show this sort of bias over a large period of time and not just in specific articles. Next slide, Sarah. So I wanna end this by just talking about how TDM Studio made this work possible. First of all, it gave access to full article text, which allowed me to read all the text, not just the headline. Second, it provided access to resources that were inaccessible elsewhere. Um, I could access not just you know, a New York Times hard drive from the University of Pennsylvania library <laughs> for 10 years, but instead every single New York Times article up to the content that was posted at you know, noon today. Uh, and in addition, it provides a flexible design environment that's suitable for novice and advanced users. As someone who was at MIT doing computer science, I really appreciated that I could use everything that I had learned in my computer science and machine learning classes in TDM Studio. However, there's also a really easy interface if you don't wanna be typing around the command line like I love to. So TDM Studio is very well suited for this type of research. And with that, I wanna thank you guys so much for listening and pass off the baton to Levi. Thank you. Just before you jump in, Levi, I might just ask Holly one or two questions that came in uh, on the chat, uh, just very briefly, uh, while it's uh, fresh in our minds. Um, so Holly, uh, so, so do these, this is one that came in, uh, so do these NLP models classify English quasi-ergative, quasi-ergative verbs? I hope you know what quasi-ergative means because I unfortunately don't, uh, verbs like sink, break, et, et cetera, as passive constructions. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. So I think I know what they're getting at. So a good example in the context of violence would be die. So die is actually technically an active voice, active voice when you say someone dies. Um, so you have to be careful about which NLP model you're using, but this is something I checked and I made sure quasi-ergative words, I've never actually heard that word, but words of that category, right, where their active construction is actually implying something passive, I did make sure that those were uh, qualified passively. Um, but that is something you, you do have to be aware of. A model may not do it by default. And one more, uh, thank you so much. It's a great question. Thank you, Brandon, too. And then one other, uh, one other question before I move along, is it also possible to detect internal monologues? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. I mean, this is one of the limitations of quantitative analysis is that it's often difficult to read between the lines, if you will. Um, so you're only able to see what's literally there, which is why some things like decontextualization are not currently possible to be detected, at least easily through quantitative analysis, because it can only read the text that's there, not the text that's been omitted. So something like, you know, maybe there were three events that happened in the day and an article only uh, includes one of them. 
well, I can only tell you how they're talking about that one event, even though they may have eliminated reporting on the other two events, which is an important form of media bias that is important to keep in mind. These are maybe one day they'll be able to actually include that sort of analysis in a larger scale quantitative study. That's why it's very important to actually ask these questions about methodology. I hope that answered it. I, I wasn't exactly sure what the, the intention was. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I think um, I think it uh, answered the question, though, please. Um, whoever asked the question, feel free to drop in another one. I'm going to pass things now to Levi, and then we'll do the same thing. We can gather some more questions and follow up with them. So uh, uh, thank you again, Holly. It was fabulous. Over to you, Levi. All right. So uh, as introduced, I'm Levi, a recent PhD graduate where a lot of my research has focused on political polarization and media bias. And today I'll be talking about a project that's joint with Jacob Conway. Um, titled Journalist Ideology and the Production of News, Evidence from Movers. And you can see the SSR and link and the slides for the full paper with the associated funding acknowledgements and, and references. Next slide. So a motivation, or at least one motivation for, for this paper is if you look at the distribution of journalists in the United States today, there is a left-leaning skew in that distribution in terms of partisan identification and vote choices. And based on the evidence as we have, this skew in the distribution has grown over the past 30, 40 years. So on the left hand, we see self-reported partisan identification of journalists in 1971 to 2013. And we see the gap between journalists who self-identify as Democrat versus Republican has grown significantly over those 40 years. If we look on the right-hand side, we see self-reported vote choices from the 1992 election and for DC correspondents, by and large, they mirror the, DC, the vote choices of the DC public as a whole, which is substantially different than the vote choices of the US public. And this distribution of journalist partisanship has led some to conclude that there must be a liberal leaning bias in the media because journalists uh, are only going to report and cover stories in a way that mirrors their own ideological biases and leanings. Next slide. In this paper and project, what we wanted to look at was what role does the labor market play in determining the slant of news? Looking at this question empirically, what role do journalists themselves actually play in driving the content they produce? And I'm gonna give a high level overview of what I'm gonna cover in the next few slides. So first we need a model of media bias and Holly already talked about a lot of different ways we can construct um, measures of media bias using text data. The, the approach that we take is what I'd say maybe a more brute force method than what Holly was talking about in the sense that we're going to take a lot of data and feed it into a machine learning model to predict whether or not a news article is more likely to be tweeted by a U.S. politician and what their party, but more likely to be tweeted by a Republican versus a Democratic politician. And we show that this has significant improvement in, in measuring human perceived slant over prior bag of word methods. Now that we have a measure of slant, we can apply this model to 20 plus million full text articles in the TDM Studio data set and document novel descriptive evidence on US media slant over time and across journalists. And then ultimately what we're interested in is using journalist transitions across outlets to construct a measure of how much do journalists themselves drive the variation in slant that we observe in the market. And the high level finding here is that journalists explain roughly 16% of the observed variation in outlet level slant. And that 16% can be compared to prior studies in the literature that suggest about 20, 21% can be explained by consumer demand. So this suggests that journalists are on, on a similar um, scale in terms of their importance in driving media, uh, the variation in observed media slant as consumers themselves. Next slide. So first is how do we construct our measure of slant? So what we do is we take a set of politician Twitter accounts tracked by Pope ProPublica, which is about 2000 Twitter accounts, and we scrape the full tweet history for each account and extracted all the URLs. We tried to um, enforce some restrictions on these URLs such that they would likely be um, news articles. And then we extracted the underlying text and fine-tuned a Roberta ML model. 
At Roberta ML model is a large transformer-based model that is typically pre-trained on a large corpus of data. And then we can fine tune it on a particular task. And the task we want to fine tune this model on is predicting the party of the politician that shared an article. Typically, when a politician shares an article, they're sharing it in a favorable light. And so this model is going to learn what underlying features in the text are predictive of an article that's likely to be shared um, by a Republican versus a Democrat. And our model achieves 83% accuracy on the leave out um, validation data set. So we can achieve over 80% accuracy in predicting the party of the politician sharing an article simply by the full text of the article itself. It's important to note that this captures both the topic that the article is discussing, whether poverty, um, the stock market, or some other topic, as well as how that topic is framed. And so this gets into some of the distinctions that Holly talked about earlier as well. And lastly, with, with many studies of empirical studies of media bias, it's difficult to construct an objective notion of unbiased. What, what we're gonna be measuring here, here is, does this look like an article that's more likely to be tweeted by a Republican or a Democrat, the subjective optimal value of what articles should look like on average in the media industry is not something we're going to be able to answer in this study. Uh, we're just gonna be able to look at patterns of article content across journalists as they move across outlets. Next slide. So now that we have a model of Media Slant, we can upload it into the TDM Studio um, interface and apply it to over 20 million news articles. And we're using the US news stream from 2013 to 2018 in this case, which has over 300 newspapers. A nice aspect about the data is that it also has the author byline, which lets us track journalists as they move across the outlets over time, which we're gonna use later. On the right here, you see patterns in slant over time for some major US news dailies from 2013 to 2018. And here, slant that is has a value closer to zero is means that the model predicts this is an article that's more likely to be shared by a Democrat and values closer to be one. I mean, this is an article that's more likely to be shared by a Republican. So over this period, we do see a shift towards more left-leaning content. And interestingly, this shift kind of accelerates in the aftermath of the 2016 election. Um, one outlet I like to call out here is if you look at the Wall Street Journal, which is typically viewed as a more uh, right-leaning outlet, it also sees a large uh, shift towards more left-leaning content after the 2016 election. And it's actually on the same level as the USA Today um, afterwards, whereas prior it was more right-leaning. Next slide. In, in addition to documenting trends over time, another thing we can look at is look at heterogeneity and slant across journalist types. So given the author bylines, we can use um, other NLP methods to predict the gender of the uh, journalist based on their name, and then look at the distribution of slant across different genders of journalists. So on the left, we see that um, female journalists on average produce content that is more left-leaning than their male counterparts. And this is even conditioned on the outlet that they're writing at. And this is consistent with prior studies looking at partisan affiliation across gender or um, ideological preferences across gender. Th this difference is consistent with that. On the right-hand side, we merged author bylines, their names, to state-level party registration data sets. And we can look at average slant of um, journalists registered as Democrats versus the average slant as journalists registered as Republicans. As we might expect, if journalists might have some role or some preferences over the content they produce, um, we do see that Democrats tend to produce more left-leaning content than their Republican counterparts. Um, journalists having preferences over this content isn't the only explanation for why we might see a, a difference um, in slant between these two groups. There could also be selection into the type of topics or the beats that these journalists work on. And so what we try and do in, in the next section, in the next slide, um, which we can move to, um, we look at journalists as they move across outlets to try and get an estimate of what role do journalists have versus outlets themselves. And the intuition is as follows. So consider a journalist who moves from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times. If the slant between that move stays pretty much the same, this suggests that the journalist has a high fix effect. This journalist um, has a large important role in predicting the and driving the content that they produce. 
On the other hand, if a journalist moves from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times, and we see that their content changes from looking like the average article at the Wall Street Journal to the average article at the New York Times, this is suggestive that the outlets themselves have a lot of control over the content that gets produced and less so the journalists. So we're gonna take this intuition and apply it to a large set of journalist moves between outlets. And this is what we see on the right, where the way to read this figure is this is um, an event study where on the left prior to zero, we've normalized the coefficients prior to the move. And on the right-hand side, these are estimated coefficients on slant after the move. And a value of one here, if the coefficients were one, this would mean that a journalist, um, when they move, they just start writing content that looks exactly like the outlet that they're going to. And what we can do here is we can actually reject the hypothesis that journalists have zero um, preferences over the content they produce because these estimates after a journalist moves rules out one. In the paper, we drive an estimator to account for some issues surrounding journalist selection into different outlets and, and take this estimator to the full, full data. And the high level finding there is that journalists explain 16% of the observed variation in slant that we see across outlets and, can be, and this can be compared to 20% attributed to consumer demand in Jensko and Shapiro. So overall, it does seem that journalists um, do influence the content they produce and, and are important drivers of the distribution of slant that we see in the market today. So that, that's high level overview of this study. You can look at the SSRN link if you want to find out more information or ask me in the Q&A and I'll turn it over now to John to talk more about TDM. Thanks so much, uh, Levi. And timing is actually perfect. Uh, we actually have a few questions uh, for you that um, I'll tee up here. Uh, one is from Mary, thank you so much, uh, Mary. The measurement, the measurement assumes that Republican and Democratic uh, politicians remain constant in their understanding of right and left. How does the model account for a more dynamic understanding of left-right continuum by the tweeters versus an actual shift by publications slash journalists? Yeah, that's a good question. So essentially the slant measure is going to be fixed based on how we constructed this metric. And so what we're going to be measuring is shifts over time relative to this fixed model. And so th this model is gonna be an average of tweet responses um, over the entire period. And the model is gonna pick up trends relative to, to that average. So it's a, that's an important distinction to keep in mind. And you know, uh, is one of the challenges of media bias and, and studies of media bias is that um, politics is always changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's important to keep in mind. So thanks for bringing that up. Great. And then uh, just, uh, oh, I think one more, uh, Levi, uh, what is the number of journalists in the data set used in this study? Has the number changed over, time, over the time period that the study analyzes? Is that change reflected in the results of this study? Yeah, so for our main, um, so like in the event study figure that I showed, that was using journalists that transition across outlets and where they had you know, five or more articles written at one outlet consecutively before, or more or less consecutively before writing at a new outlet. There we had about over 5,000 moves or transitions that we used. And so the, in, in that analysis, the cohort of journalists is going to be fixed before and after their move. Um, overall, I think there were, I'd have to go back and check, but there were over 10,000 some journalists that, that showed up in the data set in terms of outlet journalist um, unique combinations. I forget the exact number off the top of my head. Um, I don't think we looked at changes in that in that number over time during the period, but I'd guess it'd be over the shorter 2013 to 2018, it probably declined just with overall media declines and print media. Um, but that would be, I haven't looked at that empirically. Perfect. Uh, uh, thanks, Levi. And then also just a comment here about some of the challenges uh, about predicting uh, 
uh, heterogeneity by name, you cannot assume uh, gender based on name uh, was uh, one comment. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, so essentially that's a good comment. What essentially this does is uses prior methods that's been used in um, different literatures to predict name based on uh, government uh, databases where they have names linked with um, um, gender. And so then you can get a probability distribution for a given name. What's the associated gender um, likelihood with that name? It's not something that's done perfectly, but it lets us group into rough categories um, for the analysis. Wow, interesting. That's really fascinating. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, uh, Levi and Holly. Uh, I I'm going to talk just a bit about TDM Studio now. And uh, Brandon, I also see your question about some of the compute uh, with TDM Studio. If it's okay with you, I, I'll hold on that question um, till towards uh, the end and then uh, answer it with uh, any other questions about TDM Studio. And what you'll see uh, in, the, in the coming slides, we can go to the next slide, please, is that um, uh, the toy examples that I have pale in comparison to the two actual professional <laughs> professional researchers work that we just saw. Uh, so um, I in part think, ah, oh, I should uh, just defer to their work uh, in this regard. Um, so I'll try and hit on a few of the key product points, and then I'll give you a, a live demo. This should all uh, uh, be less than 10 minutes. I'm going to move quite quickly through it. Uh, what's interesting here, and this I think we already know, uh, it was pointed out in the introduction very appropriately. But the chart here on the right is the number of uh, number of key areas our graduate students are researching. This is based on ProQuest dissertations and theses uh, data set, and it's looking at researcher submitted keywords. And it's looking at it over the last five years. Um, and our data set is not uh, complete by any means, but it does have a lot of dissertations. This, I think, is almost 600,000 dissertations. And the interesting thing here, just to emphasize this point, is that the top topic across and growing the last five years is machine learning. And I think um, uh, the third one here is deep learning as well. And um, uh, as a point of comparison, the, the purple, uh, purple bars there are uh, COVID-19, COVID dissertations with deal, which deal with COVID-19. So the trend doesn't seem to be letting up with machine learning. And I think from a graduate standpoint, there are two key, there are two key things that uh, help uh, help researchers. Two key things. One is uh, exposure. Show me what's possible within this area. Um, uh, workshops that that showcase this type of research. Uh, early grad students who may not be may not be doing this research yet, but uh, this type of um, this type of methodology could be integrated into the work. So that's one. Exposure. Show me what's possible. And then the other the other thing is I need access to great content. Uh, in the right uh, in the right format and in the right uh, with the right tools uh, programming languages. So if we go to the next slide, that those were those were some of the um, yeah this is perfect. Those were some of the pain points from our uh, our many years of uh, discovery around this solution that led us to TDM Studio. We wanted wanted to show what's possible very easily. No coding no coding needed. Just show me what's possible in fifteen minutes. And, and then I'll decide whether I want to get into text mining or not. And then the other uh, the other thing was, uh, which we've seen with both of the previous researchers, um, basically uh, full programmatic access to tons of great content. And that was the other uh, high level requirement. So some of the pain points, uh, uh, gated publications. So uh, top uh, uh, content providers like the Wall Street Journal Full Text or New York Times or Washington Post. Um, you know, researchers need access to today's paper to data mine, and we wanted to uh, try and open up that content within the studio. And then other things like unstructured data, anyone who's worked with uh, this type of analysis, you don't want to have to rewrite your, um, your XML parsing every single time you want to add a new paper. You basically want it all in the same structure, and then you want to move A, B, C, D, E, F, G to all of the many... Um, through all of the many papers and through all of the many bylines, which was an incredible uh, research point by Levi. So, uh, okay, so those were the two that I just wanted to highlight here. 
And then I think when I'm, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So we introduce TDM Studio, and this is a, a sort of product over, overview, uh, but uh, the next slide actually showcases a bit clearer, in my opinion, uh, what are the two key, two, two, two key aspects of TDM Studio. So we have uh, a, both a visualization interface and then also a coding interface. The coding interface we call the workbench, full programmatic ac access in Python and R, and then the visualization access uh, interface, no coding needed, out of the box, uh, 15 minutes, you can run an analysis. Both of the research studies that you've just seen, uh, given the complexity, the nuance, the sophistication, uh, and um, uh, how particular the analysis was, the, um, we're, we're done in the workbench, uh, but um, we have other uh, folks using the visualizations and teaching and learning context. So that's sort of the product overview, amazing content within it. Visualization tool has three um, three methods, sentiment analysis, topic modeling, geographic analysis. I was thinking, looking at some of the work uh, that uh, 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 Levi showcased that maybe we could add a political slant detector, which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, I'm going to shift over now to a live demo of the solution. I'll show you two quick examples that, uh, again, are not as good, <laughs> that are not as good as the, the two that we just saw with the researchers, but the, hopefully uh, they'll give you a sense of the product. So, um, okay, so here we go. So TDM Studio, uh, let me see if I can make some space on the screen here. Uh, here we go, so, okay, so first, first thing I, I just very briefly will touch upon is the visualization. So the visualizations, uh, again, you create accounts. This is done with university um, uh, university domain email address. Uh, we also offer trials. If you're interested in a trial, the solution, 30-day free trial for the whole university um, uh, is available. We'll drop the links in the chat and also in the follow-up. But um, oh, so yeah, so this is visualization. No coding needed. You create your data set by selecting. You select your analysis method. And then you, you can enter a search term if you want. And then you can look at, uh, you, can, you can further filter specific content and publications that you want. I've already made a data set. Let me hop back and run the data set. Uh, and I'm just gonna look at it here. And it consists of all of the newspaper articles from 2001, September, uh, 2001. So all of the articles from the month of September, 2001. And we use a, um, uh, so this is the uh, this is the data set here. So all the articles from September 2001, and uh, the uh, method we use is sentiment analysis. Comes with the product, and um, uh, we look at before and after the terrorist attack. What were the changes in sentiment? So before and after the changes in the sen uh, in uh, what what were the changes in sentiment before and after the terrorist attack? So we use we use a uh, I think the parent model of Roberta that um, uh, Levi mentioned. We use Bert. And we uh, 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 use a, um, an additional uh, uh, aspect of it, which we worked with University of Michigan on. And basically we track emotion over time. So what's cool in the newspaper is you can go back 50 or 60 or 70 or hundred years. And the order of these emotions is pretty consistent. Uh, so love, even in the 1940s or 1950s or 1920s in the New York Times, love is not a very common emotion. You see love, We'll just show you love here, it's at the bottom. But what's interesting is you can look at the date here uh, for September, September 9th is here, September 10th. So this is where the terrorist attack happens. And you can look at the negative emotions and you can say, well, of course you'd expect the reaction uh, in the New York Times. These are all the articles from the bicycle ads, front page, last page, everything in between. Of course, the reaction is gonna be negative uh, to the tragic event, but what were the discrete emotions? So this you can see is, uh, uh, this green line is fear. So fear usually exists at around a five or 6% expressed emotion on a daily level. And here it doubles two X's. Sadness also increases. Uh, that's the blue line here. Uh, and what was interesting and still I found remarkable is that anger doesn't, uh, doesn't increase following the terrorist attack, which was, uh, I think, notable. Okay, so that's super quick example. You could apply the same methods to, you know, how does inflation uh, impact uh, consumer sentiment? How does, uh, how do, uh, how do consumers feel about different brands, different products, different politicians? What are the politicians? What are the emotions that lead to election and so forth and so on? So that's the visualization. 
no coding needed, full programmatic access. And now in very, uh, very, uh, uh, very few minutes, I'll just uh, sh show you very quickly the, um, the workbench. So workbench, both uh, Levi and Holly use the workbench side of things. And here you get full programmatic, programmatic access to as much content um, uh, as uh, your institution subscribes to. There are some titles we don't have data mining rights to, but we have access to a lot. They can be up to 2 million documents. We had one researcher loop through 180 million newspaper articles in a weekend. That's the current record. So I think that's approximately 10% uh, of our total newspaper holdings. Um, so you create a data set here. You can create one. Um, let's say I'm interested in the New York Times. Full coverage of the New York Times uh, going back to 1851. Uh, Wall Street Journal newspaper content, dissertations and theses, and so forth and so on. Um, I'm not actually going to create this data set. Oh, yeah, let me select one here, New York Times. Uh, but yeah, so once you've made your data set, uh, you can enter search terms. You can see today's newspaper, March 8th. Um, and then once you've create, created your data set, you then can analyze your data set. So they can be large, up to 2 million documents. You can have 10 of them at a time. You can delete them and make more of them. And then, um, yeah, once you have created your data set, then you open your Jupyter Notebook here. So common open source coding uh, platform, uh, we support Python and R. And then uh, what you can do, you can write and run scripts against, really simple write and run scripts against the content. So this is a very simple one. And basically, um, although uh, um, uh, 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 this one is looking at uh, search terms and it's looking at, uh, in the last 10 years of the New York Times, approximately 600,000 uh, documents the last 10 years, which of these terms, I'm not including Trump, although that would be a good one to include, which of these terms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, chat, GPT, or data science occurs the most? So quite a simple example, but it makes for a nice, uh, nice quick demo. So I plot those over time down here. This is again, a sample script that comes with the studio. Um, and what, what shocked me here was not that artificial intelligence was the most common in the New York Times uh, over, over time, but was this red spike of chat GPT and how it has sort of taken the news by storm uh, within the last few months. So you can see this massive red spike here. So this is counting number of, uh, number of term occurrences over time. I think it's by quarter. Uh, for, for the last 10 years. So this is something very simple example, but something you could then expand upon. So um, I'm going to stop there. That is the uh, solution overview. I think we probably have a number of questions. And then um, let me take a look here. I thought I saw a few come through, sorry. Let me stop sharing here, stop share. Okay, so, um, so we have Brandon's question. We have a few more, oh, Sierra, oh yeah, okay. So, um, sentiment analysis, exactly, yep. Uh, sorry, I'm just catching up on the questions here. Uh, so the first one, uh, Brandon, you had a question. When employing NLP tools, we have found that the computational demands placed upon our systems are considerable and even prohibitive in some cases. Will the use of TDM Studio circumvent the issues? So this is a great question, Brandon. And I would say it's not going to solve the issue entirely. Um, we too, uh, since computing comes with the product, we too also have to pay for computing. And that means that within the studio, there is some computing and we do burst computing based on researcher demand. But um, if you wanna train a, a massive language model within TDM Studio, I mean, it, it would cost millions of dollars in computing. So not, not, that's not gonna be possible, but we try and accommodate some uh, or most use cases. And uh, if Levi or Holly wanna jump in, feel free. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually have direct experience with this. So I, I... In addition to using the Python and R in TDM Studio, I actually wanted to run Stanford Core NLP because it's a very sophisticated NLP tool, but this is Java-based and it's also very expensive, especially the more uh, computationally expensive models that you run. So I was actually able to use some parallel computing to get it to run faster within TDM's computational framework. I think if you, I mean, to the extent that you can use, you know, parallel computing and other optimization strategies to uh, improve runtime, uh, that is absolutely possible for you to do in TDM Studio. Obviously, as John's saying, there's always some sort of computational limit, but I was able to do this for a lot more than I'm able to do on, you know, even I have a very nice, uh, 
desktop. I've used at MIT, you know, cloud computing before, and I was pretty impressed by the quantity that they were supporting, at least for my needs. But obviously, there's always a limit. Yeah, and, and, and in my use case, uh, I, I think there's a default kind of instant size that you get on the of the TDM Studio, and I, I was able to get. Uh, I guess the burst access that John was talking about to bump it up a little bit when I had to apply the model to the 20 million articles to speed that process up a little bit. Um, but that was pretty easy, easy to do. Those are great uh, comments. Thank you both. Um, so I'm just going to take one other question off the list here. And um, I'm sorry, whoever asked about the OCR question, I don't actually know the answer. So I'll, I'll loop back to you with that answer. Um, is it possible to take out stop words prior to sentiment analysis? Other, otherwise neutral emotion always is the highest in the results. You're absolutely right. Just to quickly tackle that one, within the coding interface, we include the model and the script, and you can definitely pre-process the data uh, by adding a few lines of code there. Um, so now I'll pass it over to Sarah uh, to, for a few logistical things. Thank you all for listening. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes over time. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. I very much appreciate everyone's time. Thank you to Levi and Holly, our presenters. Thank you to ProQuest for sponsoring this. I know we are a bit over time. Thank you all for attending, well done. I want to highlight real quickly that CEGS will be hosting our summer workshop at New Dean's Institute in Denver, Colorado, July 8th through 12th. Registration for that will be going live very shortly. So please keep an eye on your emails and on our website for that. Again, this webinar has been recorded, so you will get a recording. You will also get the slides. Those will be posted to our website, and the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel. Finally, you will get a survey at the end of this webinar. Please fill that out. That tells us what we can be doing better, what topics you would might like us to cover. So please do fill that out. We really value your feedback. Thank you so, so much for attending. And at this time, I am going to end the meeting. Thank you very much to our presenters. Have a lovely afternoon.